As I was driving to church this morning, the Lord dealt with me. I'm turning off the Belt Parkway, coming onto the Van Wick, and in front of me is a hearse. Several thoughts came to my mind. First of all, why is he working so early today? And uh, the obvious answer is they probably work every day. And I looked at, it was one of those old ones. So it looked creepy and I just said, let me switch lanes and move from behind this thing because nobody likes to think about death. And I just felt weird. And then the spirit of the Lord said, isn't that what this day is all about? That you don't ever have to fear or be scared of death. Come on, somebody. I, I got some news for you today that you did not ask me for. But everybody in this room Will. I can hear a spiritual person saying, don't say it. <laughs> Die. Oh, I know we worked hard on planet Earth and we've got degrees and accolades and all of that. One day, none of it will matter. We've worked hard to get our money. One day you won't be able to take it with you. So you might as well give to the building fund. <laughs> the other day I walked into the doctor's office for, to get my annual checkup and he set me for my blood test. And you know, when you were young, you didn't care about a blood test. I start studying for a blood test. Somebody said, how do you study for a blood test, Pastor? When I know my checkup come, I start exercising. I said, I got to lower the sugar, lower, everything lower, because I don't want to see him till next year. Some of you don't even go to the doctor. You just out there right now. How are you living by true faith? So I went in, he did the blood work, everything came back in. I found out I'm actually more healthier now, blood-wise at least, than a couple years ago. And I felt good. And I said, yeah. And then I thought, no matter how much you exercise and eat right, all you can do is prolong the inevitable. <sighs> that you will die. As a pastor, this is one of the one of the parts of the job that I don't like. That's why I'm trying to train up ministers so they could go do it for me. <laughs> the funeral part. Because it seems like such a finality. I've buried kids, I've buried adults, I've buried people who've lived a long life, and it's never pleasant. It's never People say, well, you're going to preach at anybody's funeral. You really can't preach anybody's funeral. Their life preach their own funeral. The way they live tells their story. They just hire us to get up there and lie. I mean, get up there and... <laughs> he was a good man. He got like three ladies in the back fighting over him. He was a great man. Preachers lie. <laughs> so I stop talking about people when I go to the funeral unless I really know them. I just be like, turn your Bible. Let's talk about Jesus because I don't know them. I don't know where they at. 
And I would not stand here and declare because we live in a time in, in America where if you ask anybody and everybody, everybody's going to heaven. They'd be in a club like, I'm going to heaven if I die tonight, dog. Be selling coke, crack, and be like, yo, he was a good man. That's why that word good has no value anymore because it's just, it's used. Jesus respected that word so much that when the rich young ruler said, good teacher, he said, stop. Why do you call me good? For there is none good but God. Uh, he was doing several things there, amen. He was, he was number one, ref, trying to change his definition of good to let him realize that there's none truly good but God. But he was also trying to show him, and if you've concluded that I am that, then I am. He never said, I'm not good. He just referred him back to what good is, but still took the title. God is good. God is good. Hallelujah. And we throw that word around so often, but death is not a nice thing to think about. One time I'm sitting there with my drummer. We're getting ready to go on stage. And he looked at me like I was the craziest man alive. As we getting ready to go on stage, I tap him and I say, yo, Romel. One of us is going to attend one of us' funeral. <laughs> what kind of devil are you? <laughs> it is not if. Death is an equal opportunity employer. He's going to hire everybody. And when I think about that, if I were to be honest with you, when I just think about that alone, it makes me sad. Then, then there's a statement that the young people say today that I love. They say, life be lifing. <laughs> we don't know what it means, but we know what it means. How you doing life, man? What you mean life is life and bro? And what they mean by that is because here's another tragedy that I've learned. That there are some people who are living, but they're dead. Because the reality is, is none of us will escape death. The, 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 the problem is not dying. The problem is having just existed and never lived. You can exist, it don't mean you're living. Ooh, who am I talking to in this house? Hallelujah. And that's why I made up my mind that I'm going to fight everything that is trying to stop me from living. You, you see, if you want change, it has to start with a decision. When people come to me and they ask me for counsel and advice, the first thing I say is, do you want to change? Because no matter what I tell you, if you don't want it. And, and sometimes we want things for people more than they want it for themselves. You know, like Nick fans. <laughs> but I heard there's a God that can raise anything from the dead. Come on, Nick fans. Come on. Slap me mad hard. <laughs> Knicks win the championship this year. We, we having a special service. Not to celebrate the Knicks because we know there's a God. Boy, 
this is why I never could finish these sermons. I was saying something. Yeah, people who exist but don't live. And they don't live because life is lifing. The people who are born, and from the time they are born, they're not born into the best circumstances. They're born into homes that are broken. Mom and dad are fighting. And eventually the marriage breaks, and one leaves the house. And whenever that separation happens, that child feels separated. And the child has to live wondering. Oftentimes in those situations, the children blame themselves. Thinking, was it something I did? Until they get older to really realize that people are broken. Sometimes it's even worse. They're born into a home where people abuse children. Where people are taken advantage of. There is no doubt in this room right now, as I'm saying this, and people sometimes say, don't talk about that stuff in church. There's guaranteed people in this room who were molested. Guaranteed. And people think that that is just an issue for women. There are men in this room that were probably molested. And life is a lifing. And we see this when, when, when people at a ground level become adults, the issues grow bigger. Somebody said it like this. Adult is just spending the other half of your life trying to fix the first half. Come on, how many of you still trying to fix something? life is life and people get hurt people people who have good lives growing up eventually realize that life is not a bed of roses and when they get thrusted out there in the world they realize people don't agree with you on everything people don't agree with your politics people don't agree with the way you look people don't agree with your your view in life and they challenge it and when they don't like you they do things to hurt you and you go to work and you don't know why somebody at the job don't like you they keep setting you up and if you're wondering that don't happen to me I didn't say it. And this hatred in people's heart. You know, as a kid growing up in a Christian home, I never understood when people talked about jealousy. I was like, there's really people jealous. There's really people that would look at you and try to sabotage you. There's really people who have a hookup that can help you and won't tell you because they just don't want you to succeed. There are really people like that. People used to tell me, there's people, they ain't trying to sabotage. I said, no, that's my friend. I realized that word. Friend. I am a friend of God. And I said, there's really people jealous that until I realized, uh oh, I can be jealous too. I know the church like to talk about everybody who's jealous against them, but we don't never want to talk about that time you get on Instagram. You like, <laughs> you ain't never been mad at somebody and don't know why you mad at them. And sometimes you don't even intend to be jealous. It's just that you look at their life and you tell yourself I should have been where they at and because I'm not you start being mad at somebody who's lying in their picture <laughs> and there are people who are hurting there are people who are living but not living there are people who are married but that don't feel like a marriage it feel like war if I knew marrying you, I was going to have to prove who I was every day. You feeling like, the, what's her name in the movie? All oh, my life I had to fight. <laughs> what movie was that again? Yeah, you feeling like that? The young folks are like, I don't know what that is. <laughs> you feel like you got to fight 
And then some of you get into relationships. We disregard the word of the Lord because life is all about how you feel, right? And so when you was on the boat, right? <laughs> you was feeling happy on the boat, right? And somebody come when they put on that one soca song. The one about a bumper, a car bumper. Why do they always sing about car bumpers? These people love car bumpers. And you didn't follow the rules that you ain't supposed to sleep with nobody till you get married. You slept with them. And then they left you. And then the cycle continued. I got two problems, Lord. One, if I physically die, that seemed like a finality. But if I'm living, life keep living, uh, uh, life in and trying to kill me. That's somebody that used to say this and used to say that some people who are dead, they just shame to close their eyes. <laughs> people in this room as much as you've achieved you still feeling dead there are men in this room there are husbands in this room that's feeling dead there's fathers in this room that are angry there are people that are hurt there are people there's all types of thing in this room and I'm saying I got two problems if I'm alive I got all these things trying to kill me if I'm dead I got that is there something that can defeat death the title of my sermon after this six hour intro. I want to talk to you for the next six weeks because that's how long you've been missing from church. My subject today is risen. Risen. Can we pray? Father, I just thank you for your word. I thank you for what you're going to do in this house. Move in this house like only you can. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's go to the word of the Lord. In the book of Matthew chapter 27 verse number 57. And we're going to read the story. Of the resurrection together. Amen. The Bible says. In the book of Matthew chapter 27 verse 57. And I'm going to jump around so we can get the story. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph. Who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. So I want you to know that not only people who are in poverty follow Jesus. Come on, somebody. It's either y'all are rich and y'all ain't like that, or you're poor and you're like, well, wait a minute. But I want you to know that sometimes we make it sound like the gospel is only for the downtrodden. It don't matter your status in life. We all need Jesus. And I'm glad because the disciples at this time was on the run, and even if they weren't, they didn't have enough money to honor his burial the way this man did. Sometimes God will cause you to become a person of influence and wealth for the sake of honoring him. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. And so, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus? Go into Pilate. Of course he could go to Pilate because he's a person of influence. It's good to have people who love Jesus that can walk into political offices. Amen, Amen somebody. And he asked for Jesus' body and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body and wrapped it in clean linen cloth and placed it in his own new tomb. In his own new tomb. 
that he had cut out from the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting opposite the tomb. Because sometimes when things in your life dies, it feels like part of you has died too. And so they're just sitting, watching the stone close every piece of hope, every dream they have ever had. And Joseph is gone about his business, the rich man. And the two ladies just sat, no doubt probably weeping. Jesus is dead. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, remember that while he was still alive, that the deceiver said, after three days, I will rise again. Hallelujah. So we've got a couple things going on. You got... Jesus, the Galilean, is dead. And I want, I want you to picture this for a minute, right? Jesus, who turned these 12 men's life upside down. When he met Peter, Peter brought him on his boat and, and Jesus performed a miracle. And Peter was casting his net all night and couldn't catch anything. And just like when we met Jesus... What we found impossible when he steps into our life becomes possible. Anybody in the room like Peter, where when you met him, hallelujah, what wasn't working, all of a sudden he put a little Jesus on it and it changed. And Peter was toiling all night and couldn't. And Jesus said, cast out your net one more time. And he said, it's because you said it, hallelujah. And he did it and when he Pulled his net up. It was so many that the Bible says the nets begun to break. And he started calling for other boats to come. Hallelujah. And he turned to Jesus and he said, I'm not worthy of you. And Jesus said, don't even worry about that because you never will be. You never were. So don't worry about qualifying. Hallelujah. He said, just do this. Follow me and I will make you a fisher of men. And everything that Peter knew. About boating and all that he spent his life learning about fishing. He dropped his whole career and identity. And said I'm going to follow this Galilean. I want you to know in this room that if you give up everything for Jesus. You don't lose anything. I remember him meeting Matthew. Matthew worked in corporate America. Well actually he worked for the government. He worked for the IRS. And, and, and his thing was different from, well, I don't know. Um, but he robbed people. <laughs> Got to be careful. Don't want to go to jail. <laughs> and he's trying to figure out life and he's robbing people and he's He's deceiving people and Jesus calls him and he leaves that life. There's so many people that Jesus touched and their lives were changed as a result. And I could imagine Peter and them rolling with Jesus, man. And everywhere they go, the disciples are seeing what he does. They see him raise the dead. They see him call Lazarus back to life. They seen him touch the eyes of the blind. They seen him touch the deaf ears and they heard and they see in all this. And when he met these ladies that we hear about, some of them didn't live such clean lives. Some of them were caught in the act of doing things, but he wrote in the ground. And as he wrote in the ground, all of the accusers dropped their stones. And for the first time, women were being liberated and set free because of him to the point when it was time for him to die. They started washing his feet with their hair. 
Y'all know how ladies are with their hair. <laughs> and Jesus is rolling with them. And this is big time. Everywhere they went, this is Jesus. Crowds are coming from everywhere. Every place until Friday night happened. The trial was so fast. Hallelujah. And, 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 and before they know it, Jesus was being led up to Golgotha to die on a hill. And one by one, they realize that this good man, this savior of the world, is now charged with the highest crimes that would give him capital punishment. Jesus, politically, was being charged to die like a criminal. Immediately, they knew in their head, if we keep hanging around, we're going to get arrested for the same crimes so the disciples them started running and hiding. Because how many of you know that sometimes it is not easy to follow Jesus. It will cost you. And it's costing them and they're hiding and they're hiding. And they watch Jesus is going up the hill. He goes up on the hill and they're beating him. He is wounded and beaten. Jesus is naked. That's the part we don't even realize. They're embarrassing him. He's hanging there, blood spilling all over, crown of thorns on his head. And, and he's saying things like, I thirst. And as he's screaming for water, they're making mockery of him and giving him vinegar to drink. And, he's, and they're gambling over his clothes. And he's saying things like, Father, forgive them. Oh, no, mercy and grace is still being demonstrated as he's dying. And then he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then with a loud voice, he shouts, it is finished. And he dies. When he dies Friday night, we learn that the earth quaked, the veil ripped, and all the signs that pointed that he was the king of kings and lord of lords was occurring all around him but not one disciple still said oh i see the signs here's my first point to you y'all you can have all the signs around you and still be lost Sometimes everything that you need to see to guide you is right in front of you, but you can still be lost. And these disciples had every sign, these ladies had every sign that was showing that he's the risen Savior. And all the signs that was prophesied about him, everything that was said was occurring right in front of them, but they could not see what was happening. And that's partly due the lack of what you know. When you fail to know, the signs will stare you right in the face and you will still be lost. You ever drove with somebody who just can't read the signs? Yes. Hallelujah. And you can be very close to something but feel far from it just because you're blinded. And the disciples are there. While this is happening and the ladies are sitting there, disciples are gone off. Caiaphas, the high priest, comes and he, Jesus is dead already. His whole goal was to kill Jesus. The man dead. But listen to this, y'all. <laughs> there are people who want to keep Jesus dead. It's not enough for him to just be dead they want to make sure he stays dead. And let me tell you why that is. Because the minute he gets up, now he demands control from your life. And people want Jesus. They hate this day. Because if this day is true, what it does to society is demand a change from them. And because they don't want to change, because we like our sin, he must stay dead. And Caiaphas wanted to make sure that Jesus stayed dead. And they were all getting ready to prepare 
for, 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 for a burial. Listen to this, y'all. What you are preparing for might not be what you are prepared for. What are you saying, Pastor Richard? I can't do this in this. Hallelujah. What are you saying to me, Pastor Rich? I'm saying that. So you got Joseph and them and the women and them bringing ointment and trying to, 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 to get him ready. They're preparing for a burial. Sometimes in life you are preparing for something, but little do you know that the very opposite is about to happen. I have learned that when you live for Jesus, oftentimes the tragedy that you are preparing for, God has a way to turn the tragic moments into triumph. I don't know who I'm talking to. It's like the other day, my wife came home and she said, she said, this spring weather doesn't feel good. I said, what you mean? She said, it feels feels like fall going into winter and I said I walked away and I thought to myself that's the funny thing about life it feels like fall going into dark winter when in actuality it's actually <laughs> it's actually spring going into summer and that's what the enemy often wants to do in your life make you feel feel like what's happening to me is taking me into a dark place while you see winter God is actually preparing you for something that's the God we serve from Genesis to Revelation hallelujah you look at Joseph's life they saw pits they saw charges they saw jail time Joseph saw what you meant for evil God Who am I talking to in this house? We got a God that when you think I'm preparing for something dead, little did they know that they're actually preparing to prove the resurrection. You say, what you talking about? You read in another version of this. Read, read John's version. The Bible says that they took 75 pounds of ointment to anoint him. That's a lot of ointment. The Bible says that the woman who... Uh, uh, poured the alabaster box she only had about one pound and it cost her a year's savings imagine 70 pounds this was a really rich man and when they anointed the people and wrapped them that ointment sheds off the the the, the smell of death but it also hardens the linen so what they were doing is trying to prepare a cocoon but little do they know that that thing ain't going st- <laughs> It ain't going to stay there. Hallelujah. What you're preparing for might not be actually what you're prepared for. You were preparing for death and God is about to give you life. You were preparing for heartbreak and God is about to give you joy. That's the God that we serve. And Caiaphas wanted to keep him dead. And things are unstable now. You see... Friday night when he's dead is one thing. It's that Saturday that's the tough part. When you don't know what tomorrow holds. Everybody in this room would like to know that we are in control of our destiny. But can I tell you something? I would love to tell you. You know, that when you're young, you make plans. When I grow up, I'm going to have four kids. And they are going to look a certain way. And every one of them is going to go to this school. And when I get married, I'm going to pick what y'all picking, ladies. He's going to be somebody. Hey, there we go. 6'1", that's what you said. 6'1". They're going to have good teeth. Come on, ladies. Six-pack. Life don't work like that. You could dream. But life don't go like that. We're going to get married. We're going to be happy forever. No, 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 no. It don't go like that. Life will life you. <laughs> and things get unstable. Instead, life go like this. You get married. You get four children. Three of them shoot up. <laughs> One of them sell weed. <laughs> Y'all ain't going to say nothing to me. And the six-pack you married is a keg. <laughs> Who don't even talk to you. And the schools you wanted to send them to, you are paying back for the rest of your life. And life is lifing. 
And as life begins to happen and things get unstable, when you walk into a doctor's office, because young people don't think that you will ever get sick until you hit 40 and the check engine lights start coming on. Which, what, what do you mean? What, do you, what, do you, what is high blood pressure? What, 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 what is pressure? What is, what is this diabetes you speak of? What is this sugar? What is this cholesterol? What is this... Oh, no, no, no. And spiritual people, y'all be all twisted because y'all be like, cholesterol, I bind the devil. I, bi the, I bind the cholesterol demon. I bind the sugar demon. There is no demon named sugar that come from the bread you eat. That Y'all hearing what I'm saying in this house? There's no cholesterol demon. That is from Popeye's. I'm going to say nothing to me and life starts to happen and your body is folding and things are happening and you, you worked hard to get a job. You worked hard to get into a marriage. You never thought they were going to cheat on you in that marriage. You never thought the things that's happening in your life would happen and life happens and life becomes unstable and believers often do this. God, I've been so faithful. Why is this happening to me? If you've never said that as a believer... Thank you. I was going to say something else. I was going to say, you lying. <laughs> Dr. Cheryl, help me out. It's coming. It's going to be moments that rock you to your core. But here's what I want to ask you. When things are unstable, can you remain faithful? When things are... See, Christianity is not about just the good times. It's not about the things you named and claimed and called into existence. I don't know how y'all be doing that, but y'all do that. Y'all call, call the money forth and you got rich and all that stuff. That money will go back one day. And when things go rough, that is when I want to see, can you remain? Can you say like Job? See, like Job, Job is somebody that I can't figure out. Job is actually one of the scriptures because if you search the Bible, you'll find a lot of prophetic scriptures about the crucifixion. You don't see a whole lot of uh, prophetic scriptures about the resurrection, but Job is one of them. Job said, I know my Redeemer. I know my Redeemer. I know my Redeemer lives. And let me tell you this. I want to be, I want to see, can I be like Job? This is what Job says. The Lord gives. I would have stopped there because I like the giving Lord. Come on, somebody. How many of you like the giving Lord? Come on, Lord, I want my career. Hallelujah. Look, look at what the Lord done. The Instagram picture showed him. We balling out here. Look at God. I like that. I like that God. I like, come on, somebody. But that same God that gives be coming and taking. He takes just as good as he gives. You start to lose stuff in your life and you begin to wonder. But Job said, the Lord gives and didn't stop. He said, and the Lord takes. And what's the conclusion, Job? Blessed be the name of the same God who reserves the right to give reserves the right to take and I will still be faithful to him because I trust him because I trust him because I trust him and the Bible says this y'all the Bible says that those ladies hallelujah when you read the story here the Bible says that they begun uh, 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 to go to anoint Jesus look go to Mark chapter 16 verse 1 it says, when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb. This is crazy to me because he's dead and they are going to anoint his body. In other words, they are faithful. But something else happens. Look at what they said. And the Bible says, and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? You're going to do something and you know you can't do it. Faithful, this is how I like to say it. They're faithful but inadequate. 
You ever been faithful but felt inadequate? Like you faithful but you just can't. But I want you to learn from these ladies, these first century preachers, the very first proclaimers of the gospel. Y'all ain't saying nothing to me. The very first people who ever proclaim he is risen. I want y'all to notice their faith. Hallelujah. The Bible says that they were still going anywhere and talking about who's going to roll away the stone. They were faithful and inadequate, but while inadequate, they were still faithful. Who am I talking to in this house? Faithful but inadequate, but inadequate but still faithful. And that's what you got to do as a believer. Sometimes you don't have to have all the answers. You just got to keep doing what God told. I don't know who I'm talking to in this house today. I know I ain't talking to everybody. But somebody in this house who's been faithful. Keep going. Keep trusting. Keep working. Keep at what you're doing. God will bring deliverance. Oh, I wish. Who am I talking to? In the, if I'm talking to you, I need you to give God a praise in this house. Oh, yeah, yeah. They think you crazy. They said, they said, shut the business down. You don't, how you going to pay it? How you going to do this? But you faithful, inadequate, but you faithful, inadequate, but you faithful. They say, you, you need to go and do this. You need to go back to school. That would never happen for you. You, you need to do that. You need to go and do it. You'll never get mad. You'll never this. You'll never. Why don't you leave the church? Come with me here. Faithful. And they said, who's going to roll away the stone? I know. Hallelujah. And they begun to go. And the Bible says that when they got there, they saw the stone rolled away. Oh, gosh. Stone is gone. I thought about today, because on a day like today, you're tempted as a pastor to preach scientifically. I'm going to prove the Christ risen. And no doubt there are people that's probably in this room. Let me hear if he's going to prove it to me. My job today is to tell you, kick. <laughs> because even if I proved it to you, the only way you get saved is by faith. Not by logics. Even though I know that God did not leave us with an illogical faith. Many reasons people don't want to believe the resurrection. For the same reason that even if you prove the resurrection. They still won't believe in creation. You see if you. Before you get to the resurrection. People always act like I struggle with the resurrection. But you believe everything else in the other parts. Because there's a whole lot of hard things to believe there. Like in the beginning. God. You know, but then when you start to really study this thing that they wouldn't let you study in school, you begin to realize that they teach you in science class, in order for anything to exist, it needs three things. Time, space, and matter. Matter is the thing that exists. Time is the when it exists. And space is the place in which it exists. Oh, I could go even further and show you that even in these things, all of them have a sort of triune nature. Because you exist in time in three states. Your past, your present, and your future. Yet it is still time. I thought about space. It's just emptiness. But you can only experience it in three ways. Moving forward and backwards, moving up or down, or moving left to right. Anywhere you move is a uh, derivative of one of those directions. It's three movements, yet one. I realize that matter is made up of atoms. And inside an atom, let me see who remembers science class. They tell you there's three things in it. A. 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 Come on, somebody. Who said New York public schools ain't doing good? (laughs) 
That trialness in everything that he made is seen. That's why Paul, Paul, the apostle Paul says, if you really want to see him, the invisible can be seen by the visible. If you just look around and stop for a second, you would see that God exists. Oh, our God is alive. And I thought to myself, I could take that approach. thought to myself it's very easy to see from scripture that Jesus is alive because you got 12 men who were running and hiding for their lives when he's dead but soon after that third day they was ready to risk it all what causes men to go from scared to dying to I don't care if I die I am no longer scared of death what did they see look around and you're wrestling with this problem I want you to know everybody in this room listen to me and those watching let me tell you something this day is not about you keeping a ritual and coming to your annual service this day is not about you going home with a feeling this day is challenging everything that the culture is telling you is not true that there is a God and he defied Yes! I'm getting ready to bring this home. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And, and I thought about all these things and, and then I, I ran into Brother Apostle Paul. Paul causes a lot of problem for a lot of people. People would rather get rid of Paul than Jesus at times. Because people do foolishness in society like say, well, Jesus never spoke on this topic, so why should we in the church? Not Paul. Oh, y'all ain't going to go there because, oh, we got to be politically correct in the church. But I'll say it like I, like I say it. I, I ain't scared of nobody up in here. <laughs> Jesus never discussed certain life. Well, Paul did, though. Jesus didn't talk about certain philosophies and ideology, but Paul did. And a lot of people got a lot of problems with Paul. Paul is the one who comes out, unless you or no man can enter into the kingdom of God if he's a fornicator, adulterer, liar. He'd be sitting there like, dang, Paul, you got to tell everybody's business. And, and then he said, no, you ain't going to heaven if you do this. I like Jesus better. He was a little more graceful. You think Jesus was as graceful? Because grace in your concept is let you do whatever. That's not grace. Grace never leaves you as you are. So whatever you heard on TV about we got grace. Just out here. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. You pray for me. That was very graceful. That was a graceful move. Grace does not leave you as you are. And I get to Apostle Paul, and I start reading some of the things that Paul said. And Paul begins to deal with the first problem I had if I'm physically dead. Paul's talking to the Corinthians church, and the same thing that is happening in America today is what was happening then. People like moral Jesus. People like grace Jesus. But the resurrected Jesus, that's a little hard. Did he really rise? And they started saying, there's no such thing as resurrection. And brother Apostle Paul begins to speak to the Corinthians church in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 1. And I'm almost done, y'all. And I'm just going to let the Bible speak. Look at what he says. Now, brothers and sisters... I want to remind you of the gospel I preach to you. Look at what he says. Which you received and which you have taken your stand. By the gospel you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise you have believed in vain. 
For what I receive, I passed on to you as a first importance that Christ, number one, died. This is the gospel. That he died for our sins according to scriptures. And that he was buried and it didn't stop there. And that he was raised on the third day according to scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. What Paul is saying is, y'all want to argue over if he's risen? First, go look at the life of the 12 apostles, how it drastically changed. And tell me, what did they see? He said, if you can tell me what causes 12 men to risk it all, because you can say they were gaining money, but these, they didn't gain no money even after. They didn't live in palaces. As a matter of fact, they were martyrs after that, but they did not care. Paul said, you don't even got to believe me. There's 500 other people after he rose that he appeared to, and go check their witnesses in Jerusalem. Go talk to them. Some of them are still alive. Some of them are dead, but you can find them and talk to them. You know what these scholarly people come and say and try to tell believers that those 500 people had hallucinated and saw Jesus. If 500 people hallucinate the same hallucination, you got some explaining to do. That is more impossible. Paul said, you don't got to take my word for it. Don't believe me. Go ask other people. And then he goes on and he says, look at this. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me as to one abnormally born. See, I used to kill Christians. I used to hate Christ. I used to hate him until he knocked me off my high horse. Oh, this is the same man that wrote things like, oh, that I may know him in his suffering and in his resurrection. He said, I was on my high horse. I was filled with pride. I hated believers. I hated what they stood for, and I would want to kill them, but he saved me. If you jump ahead to the same scripture in verse 12, 15, 12, he says, but if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. And so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. Paul is saying that if Christ didn't rise, the biggest liar on planet earth are Christians. Look, look, he says our witnesses are false. More than that, we are found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead, but he did not raise him in, if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has, has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. And if only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are people who are most to be pitied. This whole thing becomes obsolete if he didn't get up. This is the basis of our, oh, I don't, let me tell you something, man. This is it right here. But Christ indeed had been raised from the dead. And the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. I want you to know that you, let, let, let me tell you something. We think of death as a finality. I wonder if death is the beginning of the first day of the rest of your life. I wonder if death is actually the, the, the beginning of the first hour of the rest of your life. I wonder, no, no, no. I wonder if death is actually the beginning of the first minute of the first hour of the rest of your life. I wonder if death is actually the first second of the first minute 
of the rest. I wonder if death is actually the first sentence I spoke of the rest of it. I wonder if death is actually the first word of the first sentence of the rest of your life. I wonder if death is the first letter of the first. I wonder if death, let me, what I'm trying to tell you is that this earth ain't even a fraction compared to eternity with God. You will live forever. I just don't know your location. And religion is not about all the things we've made it. I feel like preaching. I don't care who. Religion is not about houses and cars. We've made it about houses and cars. Religion is not about God giving you this superpower so you can walk around and be prophetess, apostle, deacon, pope, whatever you are, and you alone can talk the demons and all this. I'm not saying God don't do that. He does. But we have taken all of this now and made our identity. Oh, religion is not about none of that. Christianity is not about any of that. Christianity is about one thing. When you die. When you die. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. The psalmist said, teach us to number our days. The club is cool, but you can't do that forever. You better start to think about eternity. Because one day you are going to see him. Let me tell you something. Jeremiah says, before you were formed, I knew you. You started as God's thoughts. You exited God's thoughts and went to mama's wound. And then you lived in mama's wound. And everything you developed in mama's wound was not to live there. Was to live in a world to come. You developed a heart and eyes and arms. You didn't need it in mom's wounds. And you died to that world and appeared in this world. And everything you develop in this world. Who am I talking to in this house? And one day you will die to this world. Paul says, you better know that he rose. And then I I said, okay, Paul, I ain't got to fear death. But what about the other stuff? And I went to Ephesians 3, 2. And then Paul says, you got a sin problem. This is what he said. And you, he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. I was dead in my sin. I was a sinner. In which you once walk according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who works now in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we were once conducted ourselves in lusts of the flesh. Y'all ain't going to say nothing in me, but a lot of my problems don't come from the devil. (laughs) Who in here ever had lust of the flesh problem? (laughs) Thank you for your honesty. The rest of you, all all y'all know you're lying. Lust of the flesh. Look, 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 look. He said, we fulfill the desires of the flesh and of the mind. How many of you ever, you ain't going to tell the truth, but there's a part of me that want to wild out. <laughs> Always. <laughs> it's, it's never saved. There's a part of me that's never saved. Y'all ain't saying, y'all ain't hear what I'm saying. There's a part of me that has desires. There's a part of me that has proclivities, that has, that's why I don't pardon any sin. Because if one proclivity can't make it in, no other one can. Everything got to go through the blood. And, and, and we've got these issues. And Paul says, you used to fulfill the desires of your flesh and of the mind. And were by nature. You were naughty. By nature, by nature, he's telling you by nature, you're nasty. 
Oh, yeah, even the most suit and tied. I've, over the last decade, I realized that the most suit and tied corporate people are doing some of the nastiest things they usually look down on people for. I mean, uh, and this ain't to throw stones at anybody. I'm just trying to level the playing field that I got dirt. And as much as I got dirt, every one of you in this room got dirt too. And those things is killing us as we're trying to live life. Let me show you. He says, look, by nature we were children of wrath, just as the others. And then verse 4 says, but God. Oh, y'all ain't hear what I'm saying. Who is rich in mercy because of his great love, which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses. This is what he did. He made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up together. So when Jesus rose up, I rose up with him. What are you trying to say? I'm trying to talk to somebody in this house today. I don't care what your past has told you. I came here as the man of God to tell you that you can rise from that place. You can rise from the dark place. You can rise out of the addiction. You can rise out of the abuse. You can rise out of the bitterness. You can rise out of all the negative thought. Because when he rose, I rose too. Hallelujah, somebody. Hallelujah. He raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Oh, I'm done, y'all. Oh, but I want to I want just want y'all to listen to this. Romans 8:33. Look at what Paul says. He says, "Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen?" Hallelujah. Who will bring any charge against those who God has chosen? It is God who does what? It is God who justifies. Look at this. Who then is the one who condemns? No one, Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is interceding for us. Oh, if you want to know where he is right now, he's praying for you. He never stopped fighting for you. That's why you can't give up. Tell your neighbor you can't give up. Tell your neighbor you can't give up. Why? Because you got a God who fights for you. Look at this. Look at this. And then he asks this question, Church City. Who, hallelujah, shall separate us? Hallelujah. Who shall? Uh, I could imagine Paul when he discovered the gospel. He's saying, wait a minute. This man, Jesus, did all these miracles for me. And then he went on a cross for me. And then he busted out the grave for me. And you want me to think that I'm a pity party nobody? Let me ask you a question. Who shall separate us from the... Anybody, anybody in here loved by God? He said, from the love of Christ shall trouble or hardship. I'm not saying you don't have trouble, but it ain't going to stop Jesus from loving you. Hardship or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword. Look at what Paul says. As it is written, for your sake we face death all day. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things. You will never keep me down. We are more than conquerors through him that love us. Oh. Bow your heads and close your eyes in this room. In the name of Jesus. Risen. As your head is bowed, I want you to listen to this. What God did for Jesus' body he will do it yours. He will resurrect you. Every enemy that came against Jesus, God rose him out from them. And the same God that did that for Jesus will raise you.